and Torella. And, and the beauty is colored, it's from 1971 or so, you know. And again, you can see the cocks of hay and the horse who was, uh, who was a farmer's best friend. And a, a beautiful picture. So I don't want to romanticize the past, but there were some very good things about it. In the postman, this was done from uh, Barnard Garrick, who just sadly died a few years ago. He was the missing link to the outside world. They're waiting for uh, the money coming in from your cousins or brothers or sisters that were working in the States or in England or wherever, you know. But at this period, the 71 or just before, a change was happening. This is Loch Ray Vocational Education School in uh, 1970. The girls are wearing the mini skirts. So the, the skirts are getting shorter and the, the hair is getting longer for the boys. <laughs> so there was two ends of it coming. So we were influenced by what was happening with across the world with uh, pop music, Beatles, hippie movements, anti-war, all of that was coming through. This was the, uh, uh, we were getting, starting to get phones in, in, in houses. In my area, we were the only one for a while that had a phone and people wanted to make phone calls. They'd come and you go to the local pub if you're expecting a call at six o'clock from the cousin from New York or whatever. But this was the telephone exchange in, in, um, in Ballon de Slow. And again, you can see the long hair and the short skirts and so on. So change was happening. But it really took, Galway was really transformed, and modern Galway, in my opinion, started in 1971 with the arrival of Digital Equipment Corporation, as I say, the second largest computer manufacturer in the world after IBM. And they came to Galway, there's lots of different stories, but um, they came to what was really a backwater at the time. Galway was outside the, uh, the, uh, on, the on the sideshow, the Dublin. Cork and Limerick were, and Belfast, of course, were very much at the more in touch with what was happening across the rest of the world than ourselves. It was a lot more heavy industry. Gold was very low level at the time. The great 19th century of the mills and the breweries had long, had long passed. And they opened up originally in Merview, um, where uh, Avaya are today, or in that row anyway. And they moved uh, two years later into, this is Ballybrit. And you can see what it was, just a series of fields itself. That now is Hewlett Packard, which you can see right around. It was very much on the outskirts of Galway City, <laughs> with the traffic now, it's so different. So it'd be interesting to do a Google, I should have done a Google um, uh, picture of it and compared it to today. So that was really the beginning of Galway, because once they began, came at the like, electronic manufacturers, there was the service industry, and a lot of other uh, companies came as well. And, why did they come? There were five reasons why these companies came. Uh, this was the first overseas operation for Digital Equipment Corporation. And they came for a number of reasons. We were about to enter the European uh, Economic Community, as it was called, so it was going to be um, uh, an avenue into the European market. And you had to have 50% of manufacturing goods within the, uh, within the European e uh, Economic Union, otherwise there was, was huge uh, tariffs involved. We had an English-speaking uh, uh, workforce, and remember these were an American company from Massachusetts. Uh, we had a, a very well-educated uh, workforce itself, and there was the tax, <laughs> which is still a controversial issue today. But the fifth one was a lot of the management that came over from the Americans with uh, digital and other companies were Irish Americans. Uh, some of them had left in the bad days, obviously with high immigration, and they were coming back um, themselves. Um, and I remember reading about some of the first managers, they were people that had emigrated in the 1950s, but also their grandfathers may have emigrated at the far. So there was a grow for, for, um, for Ireland to give something back to the old South, so to speak. But there was also when they did come, they picked Galway rather than another place in Ireland because they looked at the university, UCG, and they said, the Vice President Kaufman said at the time, that Galway University, UCG, now in my Galway, could give us the scientists, the administrators, <coughs> the accountants that we need. So that was important. And this was what they were making, they were making the PDP-11 computers. They looked like the size of fridges. And if look, you look at the power you have today in your phone compared to that. Um, the RAM, the memory was in, in thousands, measured in thousands K, as opposed to gigabytes today in, in terms of millions and billions. You know? And they were exported. So it changed the landscape fundamentally. We became a nation for export. Before this, we were an agricultural nation, as you can see from the previous uh, pictures. And agriculture, important, it gives us food and so on and so forth. But we started to export. At, at a huge uh, scale itself. And digital had a huge impact on the Irish economy.
because of the volume that was in terms of the value anyway of the exports from Ireland itself. And we suddenly had a need for skilled workforces. The generations that were leaving the school and were leaving colleges that had any skills as engineers and scientists and, and technicians and so on, they were leaving Ireland because there was no work. Now we were given opportunities for people to stay outside farming itself, you know? And this was the digital plant, and you can look at the sheer size of it, the testing of the equipment here. These were creating jobs for people and engineers and so on, that those jobs didn't exist before. And so uh, what you have here is a teleprinter, so you might have it, have it up in the, uh, in the museum itself, you know? And again, a lot of, they weren't all just males, it was a huge female workforce employed at that particular time by digital. And they were so much unlike a lot of the companies that we had in Ireland was good salaries. They were paid proper wages uh, compared to what was there uh, uh, before. It was a clean working environment. Like for anybody that worked in the factories of that era, they could be dirty and grimy with very little facilities, maybe a kettle for to make your own tea. But here you had proper canteen facilities, you had voluntary health insurance, a social club. So there was a whole social, it was this kind of an American ethos that they were coming in with, that it wasn't just um, a nine to five job, we'd like to keep the, uh, the workforce together as a family, as a community, and do activities, not just for the workers themselves, but also for the uh, family uh, events. And, and some of these were unionized, some of them weren't. There was activities, social activities like the tops of town, and they had things like company newsletters, you know? And as time went on, you had, this is a big, a, 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 a nearly open office, again a clean work environment. This wasn't one of the original setups, but this happened a few years later, you know. And they had open days. The, the factories has existed then, they were closed, they didn't want the public ever coming in. As I said, it was men and women. It was involved in the, in the 70s and uh, mid 70s, and there was a phone call from a local principal of a local convent school in Galway, and she said she'd like to bring her leave-in certificate class up to have a look at the premises and so on, because she heard they were doing school tours. And so she brought them up and they, they gave them the full show, the clean work environment, that here was computerist, and this is what a computer does, and this is where the future is, and look at what the pay is here and so on. And then at the end of about a, a two-hour tour, she gathered all the girls in the foyer and says, now girls, gather around me. What have you learned from today's trip? And they said, um, you know, computers are the future, Technology is here to stay, and, so, and they were all giving answers. And she says, "No, you are all wrong. What you should have learned from today's trip was, unless you get a good leave in search, you could end up working in a factory like this. You know, <laughs> so nursing, <laughs> teaching, oh, 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 civil oh, service oh, was fine, oh, but bloody factory, no way, not for girls. You know, so again, not everybody was was reading from the same book, so to speak. You know." And there was newsletters, so this is from about 78, so again there was a type of bonding, there was a promotion. Newsletters were unheard of in Ireland, and this was a regular, um, I think monthly uh, newsletter, this the, the the launch of the fax system. So again, we're proud of what we are, digital almost became a, a, a patriotic thing, so to speak, you know. And there was a social element, so for some of you may remember the tops of the town linked into the television broker, and they were encouraging people in workplaces to take ownership, and. You know, there was more than you just putting together components in the computer. You were, you have other skills, uh, and they had, that, they had games, activities, they had that singing activities, and this was probably the, the, one of the, the top activities, tops of the town. You, you, some of you may remember there was music, there was drama, there was all of these activities. It was very much a multi-variety uh, performance show, you know. And they had activities for the kids that say they were bringing the family in, so you had barbecues on the lawn, like, you know, totally unheard of before the arrival of, of these type of companies into Ireland itself. So again, that is out in our plant in, in, in Valley Bridge, you know. So modern Galway really started to take shape as we know it today from that era, you know. And we had the university expansion happen from the early 70s. The regional technical college, now known as GMIT, started up in 72. And that was critical to digital because they needed technicians. There was no local um, supply <coughs> of technical staff or, um, until the coming of, of the regional college to Galway at that time, regional technical college I should have said. Uh, hospital started to expand so they had, had a huge 
movement of, of young nurses into the city, uh, mainly female, but some men as well, and doctors and so on, and new city suburbs, you know, the, the Torellans, the, um, the Castle Lawns, the, uh, the Highfields, all of those started from this era, the, um, the Cora Park, the Hazel Park, the Cherry Park, and later the Laura Parks. And you had a, where you had a huge workforce, you also had retail growth with businesses, you know, and the water and communications network was uh, was uh, was important to this kind of population. And when they first came to Galway in in seventy one, the, the city um, uh, authorities had to come together. The the, the ESB, um, the, the electrical, uh, the telecommunications company, the PNT, um, all of the groups had to come together and put in an infrastructure because this factory was using a huge amount of electricity, needed a huge volume of water. So the infrastructure had to be put in and they all actually came together and they put the infrastructure there. So that was great. And it led to a total social dimension because a lot of us worked at, from farming and we did it part time, it wasn't paying, the, the oldest son inherited the farm, the rest of us actually got to emigrate. But now there was a reason to stay. And it was, you were clean, you, were, you, had, you could buy a car and you had disposable income and you could have the new, the disco scene was starting all over the world and Ireland was no exception. And Salt Hill in particular was the hub of the nightclub activity. It was famous from the early, from the late 19th century onwards and from the 1940s with the building of Sea Point and, and the hangar before that again, uh, what is now Salt Hill Park. Uh, but it was the, um, the, 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 these places were different than the dance halls because they had something that the dance halls didn't have. What did they have? Alcohol. Alcohol, yeah, exactly, yeah. alcohol. So they changed everything. So Rivellinos be, later became the castle and it was set up by Brian O'Flaherty's family. Beach, which is now where the Bowie um, Cultural Center is there, um, the International that is still there today, and Twigs. Now, I remember going to these places, and uh, this is an example of one of them, like this is um, uh, the International. They had to have food to get the license, and it was the worst type of food imaginable. The burgers were burnt black on the outside, and they were raw on the inside, and you got this thing called Smash. Remember that? It was powdered. Um, uh, powdered potato. <laughs> you know, it was the most horrible of horrible, but it was just an excuse to get the license itself, you know. But sometimes the more you drank, the nicer it, it tasted. So, <laughs> so that was the international. You can see low level steam, and you can see the, the quality of clothing is, is unbelievable, you know, compared to today. So I'm trying to it, you know. But you also had problems as well with the growth of the city. Every little garage was converted into a, <laughs> into a flat. And every little shed in the back was converted into a flat, you know. So there was the student movement. I was involved in that myself. We started demand houses for people. And speculation now. I mean, you could. We're talking about the same problems today, actually. The cost of housing, the cost for young people. You were literally, and it was understandable. The person that built the house needed to pay for it, so the the, the garage was no longer a garage, it was turned into a flat, you know? The shed was no longer a shed, it was turned into a flat. So people were coming out of the walls, and I remember the dampness, you could taste it almost like in the air, like they were not the best healthy environments, you know? But not all changed, I have to say, like it wasn't that 71 meant the old world had gone good and bad, you know? So if you look here, here's the factory floor in, um, in uh, digital. All of the assembly staff here in the circuit reports, they're all female. It's a male, you know. So again, when it started off early, there was this. Deep, it was almost like a textile factory today in the developing world, you know. Um, again, the separation between male and female was quite extraordinary in the early days. And this is an example of what it was like. This is from the kind of Telegraph newspaper, and this is from the uh, about seventy two or so. And it says, "Digital, are you leaving school this year?" Um, it's saying to people, "This is then you're coming. If your home is in the west of Ireland, why leave the rest? In other words, don't emigrate. You know, invest in your future by staying in Ireland and particularly the west." So. The interesting thing for males now, you could start a career because it was only males in technical at the time, computer technician. Candace Cook should have a good legal certificate, third for electronics. If selected, we will train you and receive attractive pay and, and so on. And we both sort of 50 people at the time. And, but it's starting off, they had 200 in no time at all. That, that's the males now. It's okay. For women, we have vacancies. You have to be a young.
Really, so <coughs> middle-aged women forget about it, you know. Older women forget about it. So we have you, you can be trained in uh, component uh, assembly line work, you know. So again, there was a demarcation about what was available for women and what was available for men, men generalizing, you know. And and we ran Galway two zero one two actually, you know. And it wasn't just once digital came, the manufacturing companies started to come at an increasing level, not just into Galway, but into Ireland. And we had companies like Thermo King that are still with us today. We had Crown Control that are no longer with us today. And we have Northern Telecom that became Nortel. They were bought out by Avaya. And they used to make the telephones. So this phone here is an example. And it's made by Northern Telecom, a Canadian multinational, but they were making these apparatus in Galway. And Kieran O'Connor, there was a friend of mine in college, he was in charge of the last uh, production line for those back in the 19 and uh, in the 1980s itself. So those phones were very much the mainstay of the home. But they improved immensely. This is one from the early 1980s. And not only did it uh, was it a phone. But it also was a terminal for your computer, you know. So we had video phones back in the 1980s, and it's on display oh, in the actual computer museum itself, you know. And then we had <laughs> <laughs> the brick, you know. And a yuppie in the 1980s, some of you remember what it was, a young, awkwardly mobile person. If you had one of these, you had to be exceptionally loud so everybody knew that you were, you know, it was a status symbol when you were on a train or going down the street. And it was known as a brick for obvious reasons. So you can pass that around there, actually. <laughs> if it rings, you know, pass yeah. it back. <laughs> and computer stores. From the late 70s, we suddenly started to sell computers. Why did that happen? Because the Intel chip was developed in 1971, the processor. So what took up a room before could be put onto basically a pan with your hand, which it was. The original Intel processor chip, and they have an operation in Ireland, of course, in Kildare. It was the um, calculator, sorry, not the, yeah, the calculator. We used the calculators, and they were first used in the Leaving Cert in my year back in, in, in 75. But suddenly, out of not just the calculators, we started to make consoles, computer game units. Uh, Atari was the first company that really popularized the use of, 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 of uh, uh, domestic, something you could put into the home. They originally developed the big game machines, the arcade games that used to fill up Seapoint and other places. And this device was the, uh, the console. The console is a computer um, uh, game machine, but usually just plays in the cartridge or whatever that you just slipped in here. That turned the television into something you just watch, into interaction. Before that, you were passive. You watched the television, you never in interacted with it. So when you... So as I say, that with that came a laser printer, and that it took printing away from the big uh, factory operation, the big print started to bring out political, um, literature, community newsletters. So this is from 1987. Um, uh, I was involved in the Terrell and Resident Association at the time, and soon I was starting to print loads of newsletters for the local community. So we really took ownership of this. So again, it looks kind of primitive now. This was um, PageMaker was the first um, desktop uh, uh, software with the laser printer and the computer. Now they were expensive. I think it was about six and a half thousand, but they gradually came down in price. You know, uh, after that, you know, and then we had the Computer Society. <coughs> That started, if I'm correct, Colin, in 1980, and this was you guys. 77, 78. Oh, and, oh you started that early? Yeah, because yeah. uh, Gus taught you started in uh, 1980, you know? Yeah, well, maybe a year or two earlier. Yeah, okay. And then this is you at the exhibition, the Student Society exhibition of 1980, in a concourse in September. Yeah. Russell and Gus, yeah. Kevin Conley, like himself. And there's the Commodore Pet. And look at, tell them how you did that. Uh, um, um, dot matrix. Um, look at the size of dot matrix. Yeah, and you join them all together, the sheets. There's a room where you could send your batch print jobs down there with a huge you know. Yeah, and that, that's huge. And what is it advertising? <laughs> Star Trek, you yeah. you know? So, and there's young Colin, the man that you see here sitting, <laughs> that's him there. In, uh, and he hasn't changed, as you can see, September 1980. And you guys were digital makers. Uh, I mean, they were the assembly computers, but you used to get them in kit form and used to yeah. put them together, you know? Yeah. So we think digital making is a new concept among young people. It's been around since Colin was a young lad. 
And this is Dermot here on my left. And Dermot, he, again, he, you've lost a little bit of weight there, Dermot, actually. But otherwise, you're not exactly the same. Dermot, you were up at the uh, RDS as a young scientist. You, you made probably Goey's first homemade robot. Mm, I think so, yeah. Yeah. And what did you make it? What did you run it off? Um, I ran it off a uh, Commodore VIC-20. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we have the VIC-20 that he originally mm. used. His father gave it to me many years ago from Castle right. Ellen, you know, right. and we still have the original. And just tell me how you put that computer together and how it worked and what it did. Yeah, so <clears throat> the robot was made, uh, was driven by wiper motors off a car, and a car <laughs> with a car battery, and I don't know if you see the battery charger on the, on the robot there, but You'll have to come up. Ba basically, um, Basically, I connected um, a, a Commodore VIC-20 and in an interface and, and literally programmed it so that the, um, you could pre-program it to, to take particular routes around a room and that type of thing. So it's just a That's extraordinary to do that. Project and what that. year was yeah. that? Um, you first did 87, you were... 86 and 87, I think, yeah. yeah. 86 yeah. is when you first did it, and yeah. you were just still in primary school? Uh, secondary school, early, early yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah second, you first year, I think, in secondary first school. Year, you know? So like again, it. we think of young people in Ireland doing digital mm. making, exhibiting their stuff at Young Scientists of mm. the Year up in, um, in at the RDS is a new phenomenon. Mm. No, it's been around for a long, long time, so well done. And who's, who's building the robot today? Um, well, my son James is working on it at the moment, uh, so I'm going to try and yeah. so get it's it going like again. Yeah, rebuilding yeah. <laughs> it from the old parts like itself, you know. Yeah. So that would be a great challenge, James. Best of luck now with that. James, what year are you in and what school? Yeah, first year in jazz. So you're continuing your father's tradition, so very good. <laughs> and I'm involved, this was me this morning, I'm one of the founder members of Coder Dojo, where we, we teach young people how to code, thanks to languages like Scratch. And everybody thinks, oh, this is a totally new phenomenon. We have parents coming together with young people, learning how to code. We were doing this back in the early 80s on Saturday mornings. So it's amazing that certain things we think today are totally new. In those days, it was very little down, uh, uh, application software. We had to write our own. So the idea was Declan, um, Europe, uh, one of the teachers, people involved in that, Brenda Donnelly is now a teacher of maths uh, at the Bish. And Bob Lucknow was a teacher in the uh, GMIT up on, and I still think he is itself. John Cunning was the editor of Trivet, and he came along with his own his son. Uh, and girls did come as well, but it was mainly sadly boys actually, but uh, it's much more prominent now with girls. But we think Coder Dojo and learning how to code together and bonding between male and, and, and uh, sorry, parent and child is a new phenomenon that was happening in Galway. Don't, I'm not sure if it was happening anywhere else in Galway or in Ireland, but it was certainly happening here. We think about the internet and the World Wide Web has been a new phenomenon. The World Wide Web was developed uh, by Tim Berners-Lee in 1990. But in Ireland, we were connecting. Uh, from our house, we were making bookings um, for travel. We were doing betting with the betting office. Uh, we were checking our bank accounts. But in France, not in Ireland now, I should say, in France in 1982, every single home Got one of these for an area pressure. This is the mini tap. And this connected over your telephone line, nice and small, compact, and you could use it to interconnect with your bank and interconnect with your travel company and interconnect with your shop. And it was brought in, oh, well, the, some of the street parks, not all, it was brought into Ireland uh, by Telecom Air, and they, they were then the state telephone company. And quite a few businesses were using this, and it only ceased to exist a few years ago. And I, I think it was about five years ago, um, sorry, six years, yeah, five years ago, it ceased to exist and they still had 70,000 members. So France introduced these, Irish people took them on the board, business communities got together through tele with Telecom Air Stern to promote it. And lots of people I knew in the 80s were using this for what we consider a new, a, a, an online, a new feature of, of the modern world of, of the 21st century. But that was taking place in Go and in Ireland inspired by what was happening in France back in the, in, in the early 1980s. This computer is on display up at the, at the, um, the computer museum. And this is a, a friend of mine from college days. and Her name is Joyce McCreevy. And what we were doing, we were working in a factory in the early 80s called 
ISM, which was founded by Irish people that had emigrated and Irish Americans, and was known as Information Sources Limited. And what we were doing is we were developing and then using uh, a search engine for libraries. So we were reading all the books in the American publications like National Geographic, Newsweek, Time, and some of the not so the more adult ones as well. And we were summarizing all the articles, storing them on, on, on disk, and we had to tag them. You know, if it was saying about <coughs> um, yeah, solidarity, yeah, it would be politics, Poland, Iron Curtain, communism, you know, using all those tags. So tagging, searching, uh, online is not a new phenomenon. It was happening in Galway, and they were doing it for, specifically for the American libraries, but it did happen, and it was being done from Galway at that period of time, you know? And that was a taxi driver in New York, and so on, and he saw the way computers were developing the early 70s, and he was very much a, a, a good business person. And he wanted to, he brought it out for just before the Christmas of, of that year, um, it has, has, as a computer for the home market. And how did he convince parents to buy it? You know? What he did was he hired Captain James T. Kirk from the USS Enterprise, Star Trek, or William Shatner. And he said in the ad, this is the future. And sure, he was from the future. You know? And of course, people bought it. You know? And it was more than just games. You could do your accounts, you could do connectivity over the telephone line, and you could play games. And this is the ad itself. I'll just play it now. Why buy the video game on Atari and Nintendo? Invest in the wonder computers of the 1980s for only $300. A Commodore Big 20. Unlike games, it has a real computer keyboard. With a Commodore Big 20, the whole family can learn computing at home. Place great games too. Under $300 of wonder computers of the 1980s, the Commodore Big 20. Coming soon, Commodore Chris Ucorp, the wonder arcade game, and Omega Racing home version. Now, interesting, that was highly successful, as I say, as a great app. But those computers had a big negative impact on society. Women dominated coding in the, the 50s and the 60s, and, and, and so many ways. People like Grace Hopper were famous, and, and so many others. But what happened is, parents only bought the computer for the boys. It was a game for the boys. And suddenly, girls were ostracized from the whole world of computing. And where they were... Basically, if not equal, or if not the majority, certainly equal doing computer science. From the 70s onwards, with home computers, the parents are responsible for pushing girls out of going into this. So the boys had a head start, they were doing the games. Not only were they doing the games, we had to actually write the games ourselves because there was few, very few application software. Apple. Apple was one of the, as I say, the, the founders of the microcomputer, the tabletop, the desktop computer, came out in 1977. And they represented alternative culture to digital. They represented youth, uh, um, off the wall type of thing, um, Sammyism, call it what you may. And their logo represented that. It was the bite, of course, from, from, uh, from the world of, of computing, but also it was color. It was a fruit. It was environmentalism, hippieism, all of that kind of West Coast America period at the time. And when you bought a computer, you weren't from Apple, you weren't just buying a computer, you also bought, it was a generation thing. You got all these little carry bags with it. You could get the little extras like the cases, you know? You got stickers that you put onto your car or onto your little um, holders for uh, cassettes. So again, they started the whole thing of teenageism and youthfulness being associated with computers itself. And for those that were involved with them, like myself, it was awesome. You know, this is me on the far left, and I was Apple's first salesman for Ireland, Apple Sales Person of the Year back in '82. As you can see, I haven't changed. Totally <laughs> What did they do? They sent us all off to Morocco. All the winners from the different countries all around Europe. We all ended up in Morocco um, in a Bedouin tent and we were just, uh, Bedouins came in in their camel and their horseback, or the Berbers, I should say, and they, they covered their faces because of the sand. And during the course, we all thought they were Berbers. It turned out that they were all the top executives of, um, of Apple. 
they really got into the whole spirit. Now, the big companies wouldn't have done that, but Apple were new, they were trying different things out, and they still had that youthfulness about them, you know? Before that again, uh, in 1973, um, the uh, university's uh, Department of Mathematics here, um, uh, from the university was established the first computer society for, for teachers. And it started off because the previous two years they run, ran summer courses in computing, in programming. And out of that was the birth of the uh, Computer Education Society of Ireland that is still with us today. And Maura here was one of the uh, founding members. She was a teacher out in, in, in Spittal. And thanks to the connection with Apple or with digital, she brought computers into the school in 1977. So Galway really took ownership of the whole computer movement and started to bring it into schools. In January 1982, every single secondary school in Ireland got a computer. What you see in front of you is, is what was given to every school. And they were given not just the screen and the computer itself, but the storage units. Now, some of you may recognize the storage units or the disks. Here they are. These discs were made in Limerick, for basement down in Limerick. They were the biggest manufacturer of storage units. Before that, you had the tapes of the really large ones. Um, how these were developed, interestingly enough, was Steve Wozniak, do you know Steve? He was co-founder with Apple, and Steve Jobs. They were sitting down, having a meal together. And up until then, you had tapes. The quality was low. It was like comparing a record to a tape. If you wanted to get to track 10, you had to fast forward. It would take ages. If with the record, you kind of pop it up and drop it down and so on. So, uh, for so that's what the principle was. But how it came about was Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. And Steve Wozniak was the real technical guru. And Steve Jobs was the real businessman. And um, Steve says to um, Steve Jobs says to Wozniak, listen, he says. We're selling these desktop computers. What we need to do is have the storage unit to go with us. And they were having a meal together. So he says, look, was They were having a meal together, as I say. And he had an apple in his hand. I want you to invent a device that's of that size, your, your dinner napkin, that can fit on top of the desk computer. And thanks to that, we had the invention of the five and the quarter inch disc and the storage unit to go along with it, you know? So all just over having lunch together, having a meal together. And then we started to give them out to the schools, you know? The prizes was trying to encourage schools to take up computing. Uh, this was <coughs> uh, School in Nana Vista, which is there today, just on, the, on, on Francis Street. And this is Declan Europe, they were just around the corner, and they gave them the Commodore that you actually see there that, that is being passed around. We did the first course for teachers at the university on the microcomputer, that is. We did a course for teachers in November 1981, knowing that all the schools were going to get, secondary schools were going to get from January onwards, they were all going to have an Apple II. And it started ruptures in the educational system because nobody had a clue what microcomputers were, it didn't know anything about programming. So the principal of the school would call in the physics teacher and the maths teacher and say, listen you, Sean, you're, you're the maths teacher or Eve or whatever, says, you, you just did this new thing now, computers, we're getting one of them, you have to learn about it. So I'm putting you on a course being run by the university. And I was doing the course with Ollie Ryan, who was then head of um, uh, the science section of the Department of Education, and a young lecturer at the time called Jimmy Brown, who was recently retired as president, mm -hmm. and there was myself, you know, and there was a, we had the teachers in, they were forced to go in, physics and maths, maths teacher. We think half of them took every retirement that year because their world had changed. They knew their maths and physics and now the microcomputers had arrived and we think they fundamentally changed itself, you know? And um, we started, there, there was myself again, um, office manager um, for CAM, and this is Victor Davis. We decided that computers were going to fail if they were just being used in the maths class for computer programming. And we were trying to encourage schools to bring it into physics, bring it into chemistry, bring it into geography, bring it into mapping, bring it into history. It had to filter right throughout the system. And we started to create some of the software ourselves at that particular time. We were inspired by science fiction. So much of what was science fiction in the 60s became science reality a decade later. Why was that? Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space in, in, in 61. 62, we sent up Telstar, the beginning of telecommunications, and it's still orbiting the Earth, 
and we have an exact replica of it up at the university in the, in the museum. 63, the first woman went in space, Valentin, from both of the Yuri and herself, they were both from what was then the Soviet Union. And by 69, we had landed on another planet, so to speak, uh, the moon. So a lot of young people like myself growing up, we thought, oh my God, by the time we're going to be adults, we're going to be traveling to the moon or to Mars or to distant galaxies. And in 1966, we had <coughs> a program that's probably influenced technology more than any other program. It was a children's program, and it only came out originally for a year called Star Trek. And Star Trek gave us so many of the technologies that we have today. The communicator became the, the mobile phone. And adults couldn't say, how can you communicate long distance like you were in Star Trek from Star Trek to, to Earth or long distance without cables? And a young man, Martin Cooper, saw um, the mobile phone, and he, uh, sorry, saw the communicator and he made the, the mobile phone in the 70s. Uh, the non-invasive medical hand scanner that was called the tricorder, that came out of Star Trek. Uh, the big screens that I'm using today, that was inspired by Star Trek. So, so much of the technologies, because young children have open minds, they can see everything. You give a little child a pencil, it becomes a rocket, you know, so to speak. So this openness, and they saw the future, they were young, and they said, why not make it happen, you know? And one of the things we were selling at the time was a chess set, and I have it up at the university. It has, you played it, didn't you, um, German? It had so many different levels of chess, you can take it from beginners to high level. We were using computer chess at this period. It was made by an American company called Fidelity. And why, how did it come about? Because the founder of Fidelity saw Star Trek, the 1972 episode, Spock playing the computer, and he invented that, you know? And it still works, and so playing computers, interacting with computers, it was there, thanks to science fiction. This is what we have up in the museum as well. It's called Hero One. And it was a robot that was used in Galway by the, then the RTC became GMIT, and it was used in the 80s as a robotics educational uh, device. So we were using robotics, and it was totally sensor-based. You programmed it, it could detect sound, it could detect light, it could detect motion, and you saw it in, in Operation German. And sadly, some of the parts have burnt out since. It was modeled, anybody think what it might be modeled on? Sorry, <laughs> Dalek from Doctor Who, no, close enough. RTD2 from Star Wars, you see, so close enough, you know. And it was an amazing device, and it, it took part in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in 1984. The same year the Reagan came to Ireland, you know. So, I mean, it was very much, robotics were very much part of Galway in the 80s. And we had a person in the late 70s who was one of the foremost authorities on robotics in, in, in terms of its use in our... Uh, and artificial intelligence use in, in computer-aided manufacturing. That was Jimmy Brown, but that's, uh, that's uh, just recently retired as president of the university. And soon, computers started to be used by communities, particularly with the coming of desktop publication, <coughs> laser printer. Uh, in 1984, this computer was launched. <coughs> Anybody know what it is or was? Classic. Sorry? Classic. Classic what? Yeah, the Macintosh, exactly. You know. So this was a Macintosh. This was the first computer to popularize the use of the mouse, the use of icons, and the graphic interface, the Windows. And the first batch of them, uh, they looked on their uh, uh, um, work. It's not just uh, technology; they looked on it as art. So you got the little extras there, you know. So if you look at this, it's it's a drawing of of uh, of. Is here with an apple, but it was inspired by Picasso. And he took it next day to, left it next day for the uh, com um, computer services. And he saw what it was the passwords, everything was being printed out. And that boy, student, was, was being expelled from the college because he had hacked into the system. Now he stupidly collected, he, he forgot to collect. That. And your man saw it as the same being printed out. He probably saw it when he had to turn away or whatever. He was expelled from being expelled from the college. I was a student president at the time on the far left, so I defended his right to stay in college. But he was banned for a period of time from, uh, from the, the college computer system uh, and the, the network system. So when I opened up a few months after that college, the computer center, I used to bring him and others down that were banned from the college to actually use the computers, you know. So today's best hackers are being hired by governments, you know, so that tradition has been around. He was an early student hacker very early. 
1983, every single school, every secondary school in Galway, bar one, was connected um, to a server up in Ballybrid, a fax system, a digital fax system. All of the schools got terminals. The original ones were what we call dumb terminals. In other words, you switched it off. All this processing power were elsewhere, you know? This was cloud computing back in the early 80s. We didn't have to turn cloud computing. But all of the secondary schools bar one, and I won't name the one, but it's a process of elimination for those that know the schools. St. Joseph's, which is the Bish, St. Ignatius, which is the Jez, Taylor's Hill, St. Lerner College, and so on and so forth, like the mother. And the reason why one of the schools said, ah, oh, computers, they're passing crazy, it will never ever happen, actually, you know? But you can see what happened. So they were on network. No other school system was done, uh, was, that was happening anywhere else in Ireland, and probably few across the world, thanks to um, digital, making their system available. And what they were doing is they were giving this, they were storing all the data, the, the programs and so on, at the central server in Valley Brit, and the students were using it for computer languages like Fortran, COBOL, and so on and so forth. They were using it for um, uh, science projects, technology, maths, and so on and so forth. So we have, the first Friday of every month, we have um, uh, Retro Gaming Night, the first Friday club. And it's restarting now in, in, in March because we had the museum closed for a while just for renovations and so on. And I remember a group of uh, women uh, came in with their children and they said, God, we use those because we have the terminals up there. We used those back in, in the 80s, you know. And I said, well, what were you using it for? Were you using it for the, for the computer languages, maths and so on? No, we weren't doing anything like that. We, the girls, were chatting up the boys and the fish who were chatting up the girls in Taylor's Hill. <laughs> so this was online social media before the Facebooks and all the rest of it happened. There were Snapchats and the Instagram. And we were doing it right here in Galway before the rest of the world, so to speak. And that's one of the terminals, the PT 100 terminals, you know. And uh, we have similar terminals up at the university. This was, as a friend of mine, some of you might know Lean Ferry. And I have a picture of Lean Ferry. Obviously, when he was younger in the 80s, he was very drunk and he ripped out a telephone box, you know, as he finally, <laughs> his conscience got to him decades later. You know, we're doing up a telephone box and we're going to build a telephone, you know, the, the old boxes that we had, you know. Lean, in 1987, I think it was, created probably Ireland's first online newspaper for digital staff. And they had all the email addresses. We had a thing called fax mail of the system. So we had in Galway, thanks to Lean Ferry, a regular online newsletter being distributed to people all across the world that were working for digital, you know. So again, this online media, it's been around for a long, long time. Video conferencing took place in Galway back in 1988. <coughs> this was, some of you may recognize this when I tell you what it is. Remember that big disc that was on top of the aircon building, the telecom building? This was it. And it occurred because 1988, digital says we need better telecommunications. We need to have better speed, video conferencing, a new phenomenon. And it was launched by Charles Hawley, who was then the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister. And, and there's a beautiful picture of him uh, connecting into Galway using uh, the video conferencing facility where both sides could see it. So that was video conferencing, people think there's a new idea, being able to see people in different parts of the world uh, through the telecommunication system. It's been around in Galway and in Ireland since the, uh, the late 80s, you know. So in many ways, just like the film Back to the Future, uh, we're going back in time to see the future, because that's what we have, all of these technologies that we have, you know. Um, we're having a launch, and myself and Thomas here from the board, we're going to have a launch. When is the launch taking place? Probably early in April? Yep. Yeah. And what we're doing is, this is Redmond Burke, and this is his wife. Both of them worked in digital. He was uh, manufacturing these computers. He is now an artist. And he came into the museum, and here it is here, in its display, here it is here. And just behind is the old fax systems, or sorry, the PDP-11. So from his memory, <coughs> from what he could see, he has now put together a huge series of art portrayals of, of technology. So it's not using technology to create art, it's been inspired by technology to use the old handpiece. So we're going to have an exhibition of those up there. On 
uh, I was the first time I met him when the two of them came in. Um, we talked about all the nightclubs and home inspiration. You had disposable income, had a social life. You could meet the opposite sex or the same sex or whatever socially, thanks to digital and those companies coming with proper wages and the, the cars and all the rest of it. And I said to him, it's amazing how the world has changed in some ways. I'm finishing with you at five because I have to work. This was Friday night. I work every Friday and some service has a volunteer since 2004 in the Eglinton. You know what the Eglinton is today? Anybody? Sorry? Exactly. It's an asylum seekers hostel, you know. So I, I'm working there and there a few years ago we took the old seating from Twig's nightclub and we made it into benches for the community garden there, you know. And I says, you know, um, Red, I have to, he's known as Red, I says, Red, I have to leave you short because I have to work to go out to the Eglinton. He said, and as we said earlier, the Eglinton, now in Asylum Seekers Hostel, then Twigs. And he said, I said, do you remember? He says, do I remember it? That's where the two of us first met. <laughs> so, it's a small old world. So, yeah, so that's basically a summary. And I just mentioned these briefly. Um, this um, uh, Thermo King gave one of these to all of their staff, uh, sales staff back in the early 80s, about 80, um, about 84, 83, um, because it was a portable laptop, so to speak. It had a screen, it had a storage uh, device, um, and you could store your information here, and you could use a modem to send it all your information from wherever you were over the, across the country. You went to it, you put your coin box, <laughs> and you put in your money, rang the number, and you had this interconnected interface between your um, phone and your computer, and you could send it analog over the telephone line. This is uh, the first handheld games device, uh, the Game Boy. We used to sell a lot of them. This was manufactured in the 1980s by Norton Telecom. But guess what market they were selling it to? The American market, you know. So again, a good, uh, good marketing thing. Uh, the, the Walkman developed by Sony back in the 1970s, and we were into jogging then in those times, so you, you would actually use this when you were jogging. So jogging isn't a new craze when externally you do a lot of things there of course, you know. And the disc man that came a few years later. Not very good when you were jogging because it tended to jump you, yeah. <laughs> whereas the tape was, was much better. Here are the, the, the discs. And this device, and it's nothing to do with the history of Galway, this was one of the first pocket radios. And when this came out in the 1950s, it was made by a company called Sony. Sony were a Japanese company, or a Japanese company. It wasn't too long after World War II, this device was for teenagers, you know, and it scared the pants off parents because now the kids could get away from the house and listen to the devil's music, rock and roll, uh, Elvis Presley, all of that, without any adults around because of the bloody battery. They didn't have to plug it into the wall anymore. And they called it Sony because they were trying to sell the teenagers and young people that had money. That was in the Western world, the Americans and the French. And, and the British, they couldn't call themselves, it wasn't too long after World War II, so they couldn't call themselves a name like Hitachi or Mitsubishi, you know, a Japanese term. So they took the slang word for a young boy, Sonny, and that's where the term actually came about. That was the 60s, uh, 50s, and here I have one more device that I think that also scared parents when this came out in the 1960s. This is called a Polaroid Swinger. And it really worried parents because this is the first time you didn't have to go take your photograph roll of negatives to get processed, you know, to the factory, to the chemist. You could now just take your picture and pull it out and quickly dry it about 30 seconds, you know. And parents said, what is the world coming to? These teenagers now could be taken. You can imagine what photographs are going to be taken of each other, you know. <laughs> what is the world coming to? Just like, my God, they're listening to the devil's music. Um, so every, every generation of adults has always feared what the young generation are actually creating. Yeah. So that's kind of a, an overview. Okay, so uh, any questions?